And with that, we're going to start talking about how to use the AI as that has been come commonly known in how to how to research local history and genealogy. But before that, there's there's a couple things we need to talk about. The most important of which is really what is an AI? <sighs> AI, when we think about it, is this incredibly nebulous term. We all think of Skynet from Terminator. We think of HAL from 2001 A Space Odyssey. Or we think of friendly ones like R2-D2 and C-3PO from Star Wars. And this is such a nebulous term that it will, it's going to help to have us have a basis in what we're talking about. On that note, in 1956, the term AI is first used in terms of a computer thinking by Professor John McCarthy as part of an academic grant to fund the first artificial intelligence workshop. This workshop aimed to determine if early computers could behave in ways that everyday people would identify as intelligence. Artificial intelligence involves building in machines that can perform tasks that typically require human intelligence. And despite their best effort in 1956, they found that this was kind of difficult because these tasks are often complex, requiring experiences, thinking about abstract concepts, and innovations and creativity, something is difficult to program into computers because computers at their heart are based on logic and rules. Just think about the autocorrect on your phone. When you're typing, the phone can see that a word is misspelled, but it is just pulling that spelling from a dictionary that it has on it. It doesn't know if you misspelled it on purpose, if you're typing in another language, or what you mean for it to be in the context of a sentence. It is just trying to compete with itself to complete the sentence into the most likely word. So how do we move from this standardized rules and logic into the AI that we have had growing today? And with that, we get a few key terms. First is machine learning. This is the way that machines and computers can take a set of data and be able to use that to generalize unseen data that may come later on. We do this all the time when we're doing pattern recognition, and it's one of those things that, that humans are real good at. Computers have no idea what to do. And so once figuring out how to do that, it combines with neural networks. Neural networks are large sets of data with known answers and running them through different transformations in that the correct answer is given more weight by the computer so it's able to simulate the functions of a series of neurons to be able to learn from experiences because it is able to go, oh, well, this was correct last time. It's going to be correct this time. It's making sure it can learn to understand what it was doing. And then finally, there is the idea of a transformer architecture. It is bringing context into these learnings that the neural network has done. Whereas before I said that it doesn't understand the context with, with a transformer model, it is now able to apply the same logic of what has happened in the past to not just that one answer, but the answers around it. This gives the computer, the semblance of being able to understand what's around it rather than just responding to a series of inputs. And in 2018, this spurred the growth of large language models and generative models. So that's a term that's being thrown around a lot. And the question is, what is it? And there is this whole definition 
of a large language model is a computer program that has been fed enough examples to be able to recognize and interpret human language or other types of complex data. Many large language models are trained on data that has been gathered from the internet, thousands or millions of gigabytes worth of text. They use a type of machine learning called deep learning in order to understand how characters, words, and sentences function together. Deep learning involves probabilistic analysis of unstructured data, which eventually enables the deep learning model to recognize distinctions between pieces of content without human intervention. That's that's a lot. That's a lot. So what is it really? <sighs> Think of it as an AI is a really, really enthusiastic bookworm who's read millions of books, articles, and just transcripts of conversations, everything they could get their hands on. When you ask this a question, they're not actually thinking or understanding and processing like we do. Instead, they're super quickly flipping through everything that they've read to be able to find a conversation that matches what the question you just asked them were. And and may seem like it's understanding, but it is more just repeating back what the probability is that it understands what's going to happen. It's like if you've watched every single episode of a TV show multiple times, like I have. When someone starts quoting a line, you can probably guess what comes next. Not because you understand the deeper meaning, but you're doing it by pure memorization because you've seen the pattern so many times. And then the AI is taking this, and instead of just one TV show, it's every single recorded conversation that is on that is in its training data it can make it has so many examples to pull from they can make really 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 good guesses about what word should come next in any given situation it's as i said it's mimicking here it is not understanding it's playing finish the sentence and it may sound smart and it oftentimes is incredibly correct because it's able to put together things that we wouldn't have seen because it has so much faster ability to think than we are, but it's pattern recognition, not actual sentience and understanding. So there are a bunch of use cases for a large language model. And some of those are the writing. We can, it can rephrase real quickly. It knows the rules of grammar. It's also able to, because it is able to think a little bit more, it's able to make the leaps and bounds that humans can, it's really good at coding. The other thing it's really good at is sorting. It can find through lines by looking through all sorts of data really quickly, a whole lot faster than you or I can, to be able to find that byline that we can't see. So now that we understand at least a little bit of what an AI is and what it can do, how do we take this and use this for genealogy? The first example is one of my personal favorites is transcriptions. Computers in general, but especially AI, are very good at pattern recognition. And handwriting, when you stop and think about it, is basically just pattern recognition. It works better on certain scripts more than others. And OCR has existed, optical character recognition has existed for a while, but because an AI is able to use context to figure out what is likely going to be the next word in this sentence, it is able to more accurately transcribe what is being put out there. It does really well with uh, sections that are either fully handwritten or fully typed out. The It gets confused when things fall out of the pattern that it is expecting, and it because unlike humans, which can go, oh, well, that over there is just this continued, it's not able to understand that this is something that is outside its basis of getting. 
just some stuff to note about transcribing with AI. A higher quality document scan can yield more accurate transcriptions because it's able to see more. It's like if you're looking at an old busted microfilm versus a high quality digital scan, you're more likely going to be the person that can read that accurately. Um, performance also varies with different historical scripts and document types. One of my personal th favorite things is that there is a clerk in Spartanburg from about 1870 to 1905 that has handwriting that is basically just a flat straight line and it is they record everything and it is incredibly difficult for me to read and it's a little bit more difficult for the AI to read because there aren't as many points for it to go oh that is obviously an A, which means that this word is uh, about. And we can talk about this as much as we want to, but it works better, at least I do, when I can see something. So here we have a scan of a deed from Spartanburg in 1827, and I fed it into the AI with the prompt of transcribe the deed from Spartanburg County that I uploaded. Write the words exactly as they appear and do not summarize the document. Put in bold any words or phrases that you are uncertain of. Note here, I'm telling it to transcribe the deed exactly as it appears and do not summarize. And you can see here a little bit of a start, but this is the full deed page and it's able to transcribe it and there are some things that are wrong on it. It gets a little bit wrong with the formatting. It writes the date as 1837 instead of 1827, but most importantly, it gets names, locations, and land descriptions right. And that's what I'm looking for in this deed. And so it's incredibly useful. It takes it a whole lot less time to just plug it into the AI than it takes for me to be able to the next thing it can do is it can analyze the text. It is able to look at a text and not tell you what the text is, because again, that requires understanding, but it's able to tell you incredibly quickly what is in it. It is incredibly fast at being able to skim and read through documents to be able to cross-reference, to identify common names across multiple documents, or recognize uh, property relationships throughout land records. Or you can use it to be able to connect seemingly unrelated historical records by it pointing out, hey, this person is a witness and this person is, is in the transaction. They border this land over here. Maybe there is a relation to that land and you should look into this. And another thing that it can actually do is be able to combine that with transcription. Here we have two documents involving a house that I was researching. One is an old handwritten power of attorney document that the owner of the house found in the collection of papers. And the other is a copy of the microfilmed deed for the house transferring the ownership to another to another person in Spartanburg. And I asked it, what are the names and properties that are listed in the documents here? I told it to put them in bold and then to summarize each one of the documents. And as you can see, it is able to pull out that there are certain names that are mentioned in both documents, including Ellen Scriven and a house located on Fairview Avenue, uh, right near to Converse. And so it's able to find that connection between the two documents faster than I could have if I had just looked at these randomly. Finally, an AI can be used to help us figure out what something is. Again, it doesn't understand what it's looking at, but it can pull clues out faster than we can. It can put context around it by being able to pull from historical sources that are published online, that are put out to be able 
to tell us generally something that's happening in the world. Here we have a photograph from our historical digital collection of the Camp Croft Band in downtown Spartanburg. I did not give the AI any information. And in fact, I just said, you are a researcher who focuses on historical photographs. When and where was this photograph taken? And what is the evidence that helped you come to that conclusion? And here it's able to go, well, if you look at the architectural styles and the buildings behind it, you can look at the men's clothing, you can look at the different, uh, the photography style, and it's able to determine that this is most likely a military band in the 1930s and 40s. And later on, I don't, sh I don't have it on here, but I did end up pressing it and go, okay, give me a specific, which do you think it is? And it was able to go, I think it is a military band from World War II in a local uh, town. And it is. It had no idea of doing that. But it followed the exact same steps that we as people were would have to be able to step through the logic to understand what it's looking at. That doesn't mean we can't trick it, though. Here we have a photo of some people in some Confederate outfits. Now, this may look, you know, old. It looks, I adore it. The uniforms are correct. However, if I happen to know that this is a photo of some Confederate reenactors, including Cheryl's husband, Barry. And so I fed this to the AI and asked it, hey, what is this photo from? And here it is able to figure out that something is wrong. The AI seems confused. It talks about the Confederate uniforms, but it also points out this appears to be, the uniforms appear too neat to be Confederate uniforms. The men's ages don't seem correct. And it determines that it is most likely a photo of Confederate veterans at a reunion. Not quite correct, but if you had given this to a person, it's a very reasonable example. And it was able to do it faster and give us some ideas, at least, of what it is we're looking at. For both of these, you'll notice that I did tell the AI to explain its logic because it's able to allow me to see where the mistakes are that it is making, but it also is able to teach you something to look at because I wouldn't have thought about comparing the uniform styles that it would have been neater rather than a wartime photo having been a little bit dirty. It taught me something there and then I use it later on when I'm looking at a different photo. That being said, we've, we see these cool things that the AI is able to do that doesn't mean that it's perfect. There are a couple main weaknesses that it has that make it so it's a little bit something you can't just dump everything into and give you a magic answer. The first thing is hallucinations. That's the catch-all term that we have used to be able to describe when an AI is making something up. Because the AI is using probabilities and pattern recognition to answer you, it doesn't know what facts are real and what isn't. It can sometimes make up facts, sources, or events. And these can be obvious, like saying that a deed is from 1765 when Spartanburg was founded in 1785. So it's not, that's not really feasible. Or they can be small little things like someone's name being John rather than James, which doesn't seem like a big thing. But when you're trying to track down genealogy, can really throw a wrench in there if you have the wrong name on there. Another issue is that we have a lack of sources. Because an AI is 
pulling from digitized items. It's pulling from scans that we give it or anything online or anything online. It is, if there is not information that is put onto the internet or onto a format that it can read, it doesn't know that it exists. To it, there are huge gaps of knowledge that we know are in books, are in papers that we can go look for. The AI doesn't have a physical body. It doesn't know how to go look through a book. It depends on us to scan it. Another thing is that there is the moral issue of copyright and creativity. As I said, AI is pattern recognition and repeating back to you. It can't create things. And so when you're asking it for something, it is copying someone else, whether that be a human artist or a human writer. Some writers and artists definitely consider this to be stealing, to be profiting off their work in a way that they are not gaining anything from. And that is something that you have to try to figure out. Like, where is that balance? What are we trying to do? And then finally, you just have a generalized lack of understanding. Humans have a gut instinct that we can look at a document as we are parsing through it or, par or putting together these facts and we can go, something's not right here. Something isn't lining up. And we can try to figure out what's wrong or what's missing or what doesn't make sense. Because an AI doesn't understand what it's looking at, it's just repeating things back. It doesn't have that gut instinct. And so it just assumes that everything it says is correct which boils down to a real big question of can you trust it? There's so many pros and cons. It is really up to you to decide. There is nothing forcing you to use it. And I see it as a tool. AI is not a magic bullet that will make my job obsolete, but it can save me time and help me be able to figure out other avenues to look down, to be able to more effectively find that one tiny nugget of information that's going to connect everything together. So you decide you're going to use AI, let's say. And how do you really start using it? So there are a couple things to note. The first is what the, has been called prompt engineering. It's how to write prompts or questions to be able to maximize AI responses for the data we want and the fewest mistakes. The two things to really note here are clear questions. You want to use specific, well-defined questions. You want to provide relevant context to it. And you want to structure these questions to minimize ambiguity. And the next thing you want to do is you want to have iterative refinement. You are not going to get the answer you want on the exact first question. It's going to throw a bunch of stuff at you. And you can then tell the AI, hey, narrow in down on this. You can adjust your prompts based on what you get. And you can document successful query patterns. Most of the ways I know how to ask things are because I have gotten some real stinkers of answers when I have tried to ask it something and it's just spit back a bunch of hooey. The thing to note with these questions is it isn't Google. We have been trained from using Google to just kind of ask the broadest question and then we scan through and narrow it down. An AI is trying to minimize that. The AI wants to answer your question as specifically as possible. 
So you have to step-by-step -step walk it through your question to be able to figure out how to get the answer that gives you, how to phrase the question to give you the answer you want. It is kind of like a high school student. It knows that there's an answer out there. It just wants to kind of get, you, get it to you as fast as possible, whether that be correct or not. And you have to hold its hand a little bit. The other thing to note is, as I said, we there are mistakes that the AI can make. So you have to be able to build in ways to make sure that the question that the info you're asking it to get for you isn't just something it's making up. And there's a couple ways to do this. You'll notice that I did this by asking it in my previous questions. Where are you pulling this information from and explain your logic? What I am doing is I am asking it for source documentation. I am asking it where in the sources it's pulling from and where and having it cite its, uh, cre it, its answers. The other thing is that I am later going on because I'm looking at the original document and I am doing cross verification. I'm comparing these findings with traditional sources and being able to look at multiple sources for something if that exists to be able to figure out if the AI is correct. The other thing I like to do that I don't mention in here is if I pull some information, I do like to have a little folder saved on my computer that is genealogy AI found or AI located because I want to be able, if I find a flaw later on with that information to look and go, oh, that is from the AI. That is not something I found in a primary source. And I can go back and then follow the source documentation and do cross verification on that fact to be able to figure out what is correct and what isn't. So with that being said, there are a couple different options for how to, for AIs to use. The first is probably the most famous. It's ChatGPT. It's the one that everyone's talking about. It was first released as a proof of concept and tech demo back in November of 2022 by OpenAI, but boy, has it grown since then. Jeff GBT has the ability to more easily utilize tools called other G called GPTs to be able to basically create a sub version of itself that specializes in one thing. And there are several out there on genealogy that are focused on being able to compare land records or being able to read uh, wills and estates. And these are focuses to force it to not just go all into the data, but to keep it a little bit more narrow to make it easier to figure out what it is making up with hallucinations and what it isn't. ChatGPT also has online web searching as of now. It can search through the entire internet, which is both good and bad because it's not verifying what's on there and how true it is, but it is able to much quickly, more quickly than I can look at the entire internet and get me an answer. Just something also to note, this is not built in yet, but there is the new, uh, We all, a lot of us have Apple devices. Siri is going to start using ChatGPT to answer it, answer your questions. And so as we move on, these things are just going to get tied more and more in and be easier and easier for us to use. Then one of the net other options next is Copilot and Gemini. These are free to use for most people either being built into web searches or new computers. 
And it is able for a lot of people to be able to dip their toes into AI without having to sign up for, for anything or have to pay for anything. Copilot is running an older version of ChatGPT, and Gemini is running Google's own large language model. And so that is a note, you'll get different answers out of these because they're all working using different training data, different, slightly different ways of processing through those millions and millions of gigabytes of information. And then the next one I'm gonna talk about is Claude. Claude is a, I don't want, it's not a spinoff of ChatGPT, but it's made from people who left ChatGPT because they were afraid of where ChatGPT was going. They have a set of guidelines to be able to achieve a better balance in terms of human safety and AI growth. And one of the things that it has is this ability to create a project. So you can upload something like 50 documents to it and tell it, this is all the data you're pulling from. Search through all of this very quickly to find me the answer that I'm looking for. Incredibly useful in a lot of ways. Not as useful as I want it to be, but it's still incredibly cool that you can give it your own set of information to be able to focus as even more into local history and genealogy. But... Now that we have that, we've seen how to use it, but let's actually see it in person. And here we have, this is me. This is me a couple of days ago. And I have an ancestor, my great, great grandfather, Ohanes Varshag in Fijian. He comes into the country in 1892. He goes by four different names. He appears three or four different places with no rhyme or reason where they're chosen. And there's all sorts of missing documents. It's incredibly difficult for me to keep track of. So I took those doc the doc some of the documents that I had, and I told the AI to put together a timeline using those sources to be able to help me be able to get a grasp of what's going on, about what's happening, as I'm typing, you can see that I'm telling it where you received information from and put in bold any information I'm uncertain about. That is those cross verifications and source documentation that I was talking about just a little bit ago. As you can see, I'm having a, I was having a little bit of trouble moving all the files over, but there we go. They are not named in a way to tell it what it is. So I'm giving it to it basically blind. And so here I send it and you can see it thinking, you can see it working for a little bit. And it is able to go through and create a generalized timeline of what is happening. As you can see at the end, it is more detailed and that is because it's pulling from a death certificate that I uploaded, standardized writing style. And so because of that, it is actually able to understand it more. But that's not everything. I know that's not everything. And so I'm gonna, let's give it some more documents. Let's give it some different newspaper articles I have about the different, the locations that he was to be able to build this up more, to be able to make it so it's even more detailed. And I'm gonna, I send it in and here we go. It's thinking, it's thinking. And now it is thinking through something and it's able to put in there that it has specific dates in there because it has those newspaper articles that it's citing from. As a note, one thing that it actually, that I find interesting here is that the AI pointed out something that I'd never noticed. His death certificate said that he had lived in Fresno for 
for seven years when he died in 1945. But I have a 1940 census placing him in the Denver Mental Hospital. A human would go, something's not right here. And the machine, but the machine, the machine doesn't know. It's just going off of what it's able to see. And so with that, we're able to figure out that there's stuff that we can't see, but there are also things that we're able to catch that it isn't. But that timeline was incredibly helpful to help me be able to understand better what is being, what, what is going on in his life at the time. And so it is a little bit earlier than charity normally does, but I figure that there's this is a very complex topic. And so I'm going to open up questions. I'm going to be able, you know, like feel free to put questions in the chat. Cheryl will read them out and I'll be happy to answer them as much as possible because this is a very confusing subject and that's what I'm here for. So please Cheryl, do we have any questions? We do. Um, Carol. Um, one if, sec. My headphones have stopped working. Let me swap over to something real quickly because I charged these, but that apparently didn't work. Give me one moment. Okay. Carol, mm, we'll get to your question here in just a second. Yep. Are you there on? There we go. Okay. Yep, I should be on. I don't know what happened there, but. Okay. All right. Well, Carol yeah. was asking if the AI, uh, whichever one you're using, mm -hmm. uh, can translate a record that is in another language. And if so, which of those uh, AIs that you mentioned would probably mm -hmm. do a better job at it? So that's actually an incredibly interesting question and something that I've been playing around with. My problem I have with that is that I can't read other languages. I can barely read English on some days. And so I am not able to verify a lot of this, but I've been testing it out actually with Spanish documents. Um, With that, it's definitely able to read it because it is, again, pattern recognition. One of the things that I would recommend if you're doing this is to tell it that it is in Spanish because otherwise it's probably going to default to English. The other thing is that there is a whole lot less training data on other languages as compared to English in the large language models as we have at the moment. There are probably Chinese ones out there that work better on Chinese than English ones do, but I don't have access to those. And so I can't verify that, but it's definitely able to read it. It's definitely able to try to figure out what's happening. It's just not as accurate as it is with English, but there are also GPTs out there that people have made to be able to transcribe foreign documents and foreign languages. And with that, probably ChatGPT is the one I would lean to just because it has the largest training data set and it has the ability to kind of specialize into, hey, this is an old document from France or from Germany. And so you can tell it that either using the prompt engineering or by using a GPT that you can find. And it'll be able to get you a more accurate transcription than any of the other ones, most likely. So if if the... Um the thing that they have is a document. Would mm -hmm. you would you upload it to chat B PT? Yeah, I, I would upload it. I would you can basically just drag and drop a PDF or anything in or a JPEG. Um, all those images that I used as examples were P were PDFs or were PNG files. They were pictures. One of them was literally a picture I took with my phone. You don't, you can just kind of scan it in however you can, but do remember that the better quality of a scan or an image you have, the more accurate okay. it is going to be. Okay. And then um, Susie 
added mm -hmm. on to that. She said, once you open, I mean, upload that information into Claude, okay, mm -hmm. like whatever you're going to do, you, you upload that. Does it become part of the available knowledge for anyone? In other words, no. like you, mm -hmm. you uploaded something, okay, with information mm -hmm. on it about your great, great grandfather. Now, if someone across the country is looking for this same person or whatever and puts his name in, does your thing mm -hmm. come up? As far as they've told us, no. Again, these tech companies, these AI companies, they are incredibly new and they are there. It is incredibly difficult to gain access to know how the AI is thinking. Even the AI companies don't fully understand it because the processes are so complex. But at least with, for in my example there with Claude, Claude's Claude's team has said that it is not using it as training data if you upload something. So in your example, no. If someone says, "Tell me about Ohanes in, in Fijian or Ohanes Farshag," depending on which name they type in, the information they're pulling is not the information that I have uploaded, but it might be pulling from somewhere else. Let's say Ohanes appears in a book somewhere that I haven't found, and then Claude can pull from that if that's scanned in, but it's not pulling from my documents that I upload. Okay, so which is better for that, Chet, GPT or Claude? I, 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 so Claude has, an, has a much more open and understandable ethics statement and what it is attempting to do and how it's attempting to make sure that there are still guidelines on AI usage versus uh, AI growth. And this is a whole thing of a question that is still being worked out to this day because these people are alive. These people are still over there. And so personally, I'd lean towards Claude. I would, you know, like say that would be the one I would trust with my information because of the way they are processing through the AI to be able to make sure that it's responsible, to be able to make sure that it is something that we can trust. But this is all something that you have to kind of balance, that you have to try to figure out for yourself and figure out where your comfort level is. Like, I'm still not going to upload my own birth certificate into it. I'm not going to upload, you know, my brothers or my parents, but Ohanes, who was born in 1873, that's enough for me to be able to go, yeah, sure, I'll upload this. This is not information that's going to put anyone at risk or be able to create a problem for me later on. Okay. All right. And um, I hope you can help Larry <laughs> Gale here. He says, as a journalist, I guess I can cite AI as a source. I mean, you know, again, that's up to you. Um, I I don't like citing AI as a source, and it's why I try to stress, hey, when you're looking for something, where is the information that you're pulling from? Where is it being able to go like, this is this citation right here. Um, so it's, it's kind of like Wikipedia in that way, I guess, that it is able to, like, you know, you're able to use it as a tool, but you can't cite Wikipedia in a professional paper or anything like that. Okay, so. I, I think Betty is laughing at us. She says, yes. I would imagine the Associated Press style book will have an opinion on that one. <laughs> mm. You know, I would expect so. I, I have... <laughs> It's going to be a wild ride to see how everything changes over the next couple of years. Because, well, you mentioned is... it's already changing by the week. Yes, it's changing by the week, and I mean, I was talking to Cheryl earlier, like, la like what two weeks ago. I was like, Claude writes better than I do in a lot of ways, <laughs> and it's incredibly good at what it does. And so, it's not going to replace my job, but. Boy, is it going to take away certain things, especially if, you know, as more things get digitized to make it easier for people to access, it also means that AI can use it to be able to help us find things a whole lot faster. Yeah. All right. I'm, I even have a question. Um, yeah. Well, it's not a question, really. 
Um, I want folks to know about a little bit about Claude. You explained to me a couple of days ago how it works and what these projects are. Um, mm -hmm. Can you explain just a little bit, like, like you were telling me, if you're working on a particular project and mm -hmm. you put something in there and then later on, you know, find something else and put it in there, it can continue to grow. So can yes. you expound on that a little bit? So basically think about a, Cla a Claude's project ability as a library and you have a librarian on staff that you can ask questions to. So if you upload, you know, let's say 10 books to it and you ask it a question, it's going to pull from all 10 books. But if you then go in and, you know, upload another five book or upload another five books into there, then the librarian has access to 15 books to be able to answer your question. And so it can get more accurate the more information you give it because you're giving it, basically you're giving it more access to be able to, to be able to cite from, to be able to use as a source. Because at least in a project, it's not pulling from information outside of the project. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Now, Sue has a, a question on here that if yeah. I read it, it may get a little, um, you know, hard for you to understand. So do you okay. see our question on here? Um, Let me pull it It says, up. if you create a body of information about person A. Uh, da, 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 scroll down. Okay. Yes. All right. So if you create if you create a uh, information about person A, which includes information about his wife and children, the U.S. Our new search for one of those people can it use that plus new materials to create documents about as a separate report. So depending on which AI you're using for this, it definitely could. Again, for Claude in this, in this scenario, I'm imagining we're using Claude. It would definitely just be a new chat. You would have uploaded, let's say, person A's birth certificate, person B's birth certificate, person, their marriage certificate, and then person C's birth certificate. You could then ask it all about A and then start a new chat and just go, well, tell me about person B. And it's going to be able to reference those same documents. If you're using, um, let's say, ChatGPT or Copilot, that's going to be a little bit more tricky because you're going to have to upload those documents and it's going to process those again. And then it is there is that's every time it's processing through something, it is having a higher chance for it to misread something or hallucinate something. Hmm. So, but as for going out and finding new information that we've not given it. It, uh, that also depends on the G, the AI that you're using. Um, so ChatGPT can, Claude can't, um, at least when you're using it in a project mode. If you're using just standard Claude, then yeah, it's going to try to cert, you know, like go through all of its different documents. Okay. Hopefully that kind of answered that question. I think I understood it, but... That's why I made you read it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, so okay. Carrie has a question. It says, which model does the best with extracting and making sense of information in tables? All right, oof. So that's a very, very good question because weirdly enough, we think of computers as being really good at math, but AIs have in the past been, over the past year and a half, been really bad at math because they are not using logic they're using pattern recognition. And so if three people say two plus two equals five, and one person says two plus two equals four, it's gonna go, well, it must equal five, more people say it. Um, but if we're getting into, but with the new ChatGPT version that is releasing, it is now able to use logic and be able to talk through basically the steps to answer a question. 
As for making sense of information in tables, that's it's going to be six of one, half dozen of the other. They're both going to be really good at it if you have a high quality image of the table. I would lean towards chat GPT for that just because I find it's logic when it comes to math and under and like being able to process the table a little bit better, but that's just from personal anecdotes and from testing it out. There's no real, like these things are all working so complex and they all say that they're the best at everything. It's not like one, they're all priding themselves at jumping each other at every single opportunity. Okay, I just asked if there were any other questions for you, Jimmy. Um, yeah. While I'm waiting to see if anybody pops in, I just wanted to let all of you know that um, I've been posting in the chat here, and I'll do it one more time. There are four different um, links that you can go to um, to test it out and try out different ways. There are different uh, people teaching you how to use this just like Jimmy did. And so perhaps there's one that better fits your style of how you learn. So give those links a try and let us know if any of them work for you. And especially go into familysearch.org backslash labs, L-A-B-S. That is um, a, a full text search of any name. I think right now they're only doing probate files, but you can do probate files from any state or whatever. And I have personally <laughs> found myself several different things. One, which finally um, gave me the information I needed to prove a connection from one generation to another. And I have been doing this for 30 years looking for my Patriot for the, from the Revolutionary War. And I found it the other day using this full search text. So AI is good. It's great for genealogy. Give it a try, check out those links. Okay, let's see. Um, and Sue wants to know if we can download the chat. Sue, I'm thinking that all you have to do is copy um, you know, highlight everything and then copy it and put it into a Word document um, and you'll have the chat. Let's see, what yeah. else? Um, uh, Cheryl, just as a follow-up, I was testing out Family Search's full text search uh, about three or four hours ago um, and it was going through like marriage records for me. So it's oh, not really? just probate files. So things are changing that fast. Oh, wonderful. I love it. I love it. Okay. Um, Let's see. Carol says, my parents are expired. Is it okay to upload their birth certificates or not? That, that is, um, that's one that's of those things you, you, you gotta, that's your own you decision. Call it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's not something like it. I mean, like you could, is anything going to happen? I, I don't know. I'm not uploading my parents' birth certificates. Um, and that's just personal. But he, she just, did say, though, that they had yeah. already passed away. But yeah. still, there could be something like an informant's name on it mm -hmm. um, that is still living that you might not want to to put out there. I, I don't know. It, I, like you said, I think it's a you call. You know, you have to make that decision. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then I see down at the bottom there is there a paid version for Claude? So almost all of these AI are going to ask for basically payment because these are incredibly complex algorithms that it's running and they cost money to run. Um, the both of you can use free versions of all these. There is a free version of ChatGPT. There is a free version of Claude. I personally pay for Claude because I like being able to uh, change how its writing style is. If you're using the free version, it's going to give you the shortest answer possible. And I want to tell it to expound more. I want to tell it to write more. Um, but th so there's free versions and paid versions for all these things. Uh, and 
it kind of whichever one you choose, you don't have to pay. It depends on what you're using it for and what you want out of it. But yeah. Okay. All right. Well, that seems to be the only other thing. Wasn't really a question. It's um, hold on. I've lost my place here. Um, Nellie wanted to know, are there any oh. AI tools available for the patrons on the library website? Oof. I do not believe so. Um, at least um, I Ancestry has an AI that it's slowly working on to be able to read through things. We talked about family search having uh, a full text reading. Uh, that is not quite an AI, but I wouldn't be surprised if they build in a uh, large language model uh, features into it soon. Um, I, I there's there are some available, but nothing specifically through the library more just these are things you're able to access through online these are you're able to use them on the computers so yeah um and then before we end my you can see that my information is up here on the screen please feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions anything you want to say this is this is one of those things that i find incredibly fun to talk about and and Incredibly interesting. So if after this, if you're laying in bed at 2 a.m. and you're like, hey, I wonder about this, feel free to shoot me an email. I'm happy to, I'll respond when I can because this is what I like to do. So, well, Jimmy, I think everyone really enjoyed the presentation tonight. You did a very good job. And hopefully, maybe six months from now, you can um, update us. <laughs> oh god new. it'll be so different in six months <laughs> so. all right thank you everyone for joining us tonight we really appreciate it perfect thank you so much everyone okay we're gonna go ahead and stop recording if you're done jimmy are you done yep i'm done all right, all right. and this will be posted on our